Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. This is your proprietor, it's Tony Ortega. And joining me this week is somebody who has been on our group therapy quite a bit, but today he's the star of the main podcast, oh, no. Phil Jones. <laughs> you have had quite a week, my man. <laughs> I've had quite a week, but don't make me the star. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I keep hearing that Phil's billboard thing, and it's not my billboard this thing was entirely, the idea came from the aftermath. The uh, execution was, uh, you know, I, all the donations that people made towards the billboard. And I was just the middle guy in there and uh, a few phone calls and that was it. So um, it, it's an aftermath billboard. Absolutely. It's the Aftermath Foundation billboard. It went up Monday morning. It came down sometime early Thursday morning. Uh Last no, no, it was, uh, wasn't it Wednesday it came down overnight between Wednesday and Thursday, right? Wednesday. I think so. Yeah, I think it was like three or four in the morning on Thursday morning, something like that. Yeah, so uh, we we talked last night, Thursday night. We're recording this on Friday afternoon. When I talked to you and Claire Thursday night. Again, the billboard had been gone as of Thursday morning. When I talked to you and Claire Thursday night, you guys still weren't sure exactly who had pulled it down. No, and I honestly, I really don't know. From what I understand, um, uh, well, actually, I can't even say that. I, I honestly don't know. Um, I, I don't have that much information. I was, for one thing, I was traveling. I, you know, I, I did a red eye flight back home and, you know, I, I hate staying up all night and I can't sleep on an airplane like that. Um, it was, it was a bit of a tiring trip. Plus that four days in LA was a bit of a whirlwind and uh, really busy and checking out locations for billboards and stuff like that. It, it was a, a busy hectic. So I haven't really uh, been on top of things in the last uh, 24 hours uh, at all. Well, that after I talked to you and after I talked to Claire, and again, when I talked to Claire, she said she they still weren't sure. But after that, the Aftermath Foundation that, that night, Thursday night late, put out a statement, and they had determined it was Clear Channel that pulled it down. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting things I learned talking to you was that, you know, you had been working... I, okay, I get all the disclaimers, but basically the reason why the aftermath foundation came to you is that you had experience with this. You right. put up three yeah. previous billboards, uh, one, uh, two in LA and one in Clearwater. Right. And, uh, yeah. you had experience working with these billboard companies. And so you were, you were working with a representative of clear channel outdoor, uh, sounded like you'd kind of gotten to know him pretty well. And then when the yeah. bill billboard went up, he was really seemed to be really happy about it. Yeah, a decent guy and really nice. And he said, um, you know, that the he was happy for us. And he said the office was very positively responsive about what we were doing. Um, also, Clear Channel had put up a billboard for us before for the, the Call Me campaign. The one in Clearwater was done by Clear Channel. And they, at Scientology, was, it was, I think, three times there was to my loved one in Scientology, call me, and then, uh, or twice anyway, it was written on there. Um, and they had no issues with it at that point. I'm not sure. Mind you, I think Scientology is exerting more pressure these days than they have in the past well i think the location this time was that's really amazing. really something yeah. else tell me a little bit about yeah. so uh you had said that told me that uh the new year's eve party claire had approached you and said you know we're interested yeah. in doing a billboard can you help us out um tell me a little bit more about finding that location i mean it was incredible well i had uh i was familiar with that location from before um, and then there was, um, uh, a woman who lived in LA who did some scoping out of some various sites and then uh, she'd send me the information and I'd look at the different ones, but I knew that billboard and I knew that it was clear channel that had that billboard. So I kind of focused on that one. There was one other one that I was looking at 
but not a clear channel billboard. And I knew that there were two companies that we had dealt with that did get shut. They shut down, uh, shut us down pretty quick before. Um, so I figured clear channel, they dealt with us in the past for the call me sign. So I focused on that one particular site and also because it was so close to their central headquarters in LA. I mean, you, I mean, there's there's a building right across the street from it pretty much. And then down just half a block away is their advanced organization. And you can see from the corner of L. Ron Hubbard Way and Fountain, you could see that billboard. Wow. So a perfect location. Right. And um yeah, you we I remember those uh adventures before with those other billboard companies getting nervous. Yeah. Uh but this time um you had let me know that it was coming and uh you wanted me to wait to post a story until it was actually up so nobody could interfere. Right. I was happy okay. to do that. I told my readers the story today is coming a little late. And you had been told that you had they were going to put it up between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. Yeah. And so <laughs> you got out there at 4 in the morning and they showed up at 10 to 8, huh? Yeah. Hours of waiting. But the thing is, you know what would happen if I would have went gone there at 10 to 8, they would have showed up at 4 a.m. Yeah. And uh, I would have missed the install. So I wanted to make sure that I was there for the installation. But when we got there, um, uh, there was just the two of us and we were waiting in the car and within 20 minutes Scientology security on the bicycle came by right up to the car drove around the front through the by the front of the car and back to the blue buildings and then every 20 minutes they sent a bicycle security guy over just to check up they I don't think they knew what we were doing I think they were just checking I because there had all been all these protests they probably thought that there was going to be a protest that morning that we were going to be involved in um, I don't think they had any idea that the billboard was going up. So, um, and it went up really fast. Those guys, those installers, uh, literally 20 minutes is all it took them to put that thing up there. It was amazing. Nice guys. I spoke to the two installers, really decent, decent guys. And, you know, I talked to them a little bit about what we were doing and disconnection, family disconnection. And they're both family men and they go, yeah, family first, you know, really. They were just nice guys just to, uh, you know, the installer. So it's kind of unfortunate. I, I feel a little bad. And the rep that I was dealing with down there, um, I feel a little bad for him. I hope he didn't get any heat from from this because, um, you know, he signed up, he signed us up for it, you know, went through the whole process with us and then the thing kind of went sideways. So I, I hope it didn't reflect on him at but all. But then as soon as the, as soon as the billboard went up, you gave me a call, gave me the green sign, the green light, I put up yeah. the post. And then yeah. you also said that you talked to the rep at that point, right? Yeah, I think I, uh, yeah, I think I either called him or texted him. I think I, and uh, um, yeah, just uh, to let him, oh yeah, because I let him know it was up, everything was good, and we were all happy. I There was no negative indication at that point at all. Everything was fine at that point. And then it was later that I had a message to that they wanted to do a uh, they wanted to do a Zoom call with me, but I was getting ready to go come back east, and I was already packed. My laptop was put away. I said, "Look, can we just do a, a conference call on the phone?" So I called back later at the time they wanted to set up, and I guess the manager wanted to get on the call, and. Uh, I started off, I said, oh, you guys have been great, really supportive. I had a, well, before you, and the manager says, well, before you say any more, <laughs> um, some people are not happy about this and, you know, pushing back on this. And I, who, I knew who, who they meant by you people. I couldn't get it out of them, that it was Scientology, but you kind of go, what else could it be? So anyway, um, they wanted to have us look at some alternative sites. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'm willing to look. I'm here. Um, I've got a car. Uh, I said, send me those locations and I'll go take a look. So um, so I got the locations from our rep and I just started driving around to look at these locations. And they were nice sites. If it was a different message, it would have been fine. But they weren't near any Scientology buildings at all. And I don't, I don't know if any Scientology members would have seen those 
let alone any staff members or CR members. Uh, certainly not Sea Org members would never see those billboards. They're, they're so tightly controlled in their environments. Um, so what I did was I I uh, I handed I I turned the information over to the board to look at because it wasn't really my decision at that point. And then I let Clear Channel know that um, I'd handed it over to the board to to look at and discuss. Um, and then I started getting calls and calls from Clear Channel. Have you, anything yet? Any decision yet? And they wanted us to decide on a different site. And the, the concept was what they wanted to do was just have us move it farther away from Scientology buildings. And I know if Scientology would say is pushing for that, then um, they know that the Sea Org members would just never see. It. There's no other billboard within spitting distance. The only other billboard that um, is anywhere near a Scientology Sea Org building is the one across the road from Celebrity Center. But Scientology's had their message up there for a long time, and they're not going to give that one up anytime soon, I don't think. If they ever did, I'll, I'd take it. Yeah. It's a good location, actually. But there's nothing really else nearby. The, uh, that was the, the billboard we had was the only one uh, that, was view, that could be viewed from anywhere near the big blue buildings. What did you think about, didn't she say, the manager said something to you about how, you know, we're a billboard company, we're not controversial, we're not a news organization. Right. What do you think she meant by that? What do you think she found controversial in your in your billboard? Well, it wasn't, yeah. Um, I, I think it wasn't so much what the billboard was saying because it was sort of a passive message, just, you know, I, you know, if you need help, call. But I think where the controversy that they were worried about was any conflict with Scientology. Anybody who looks up Scientology and and is at all worried about any kind of uh, legal action, even though Scientology just won't sue them, they just haven't. I mean, I think the last time they sued anyone was Debbie Cook, and they and that blew up in their faces. So, um, but. Again, if they had to fight Scientology, it could be a huge expense for them um, and a lot of hassle. And they're not a news organization. They're not a, uh, uh, you know, they're not in a position and they just probably just didn't want to, to have that that conflict and or possible conflict. And I kind of understand that. But at the same time, it's unfortunate from our end that uh, we weren't able to keep the bill. I think what would have happened. I mean, you've got a contract. If, yeah. You know how those contracts are, though. I mean, every one of those companies is going to have a, a some printing in there that's going to say, yeah, if we don't like you. We're going to get rid of you kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. But um, uh, I mean, I, I think what would have happened had the billboard stayed up at some point, those uh, lifts that Scientology put up in front of them. Uh, would have come down. In fact, someone mentioned to me that someone had called the city and the city had made them take them down before, right before the billboard came down. So I think that they would have had to take them down at some point. But even if they would have left them up, I would have still been happy to leave the billboard up because there was plenty of space between those lifts and the billboard that if you're walking on that street, you can easily read that billboard. Okay. So had it gone up, I think that it would have just settled in and and that would have been it. Um Scientology wouldn't have sued. They might have continued the pressure, maybe had their lawyers send letters and stuff, but I don't think anything serious would have happened. So, but um, might never know. <laughs> yeah, we may never know, but um, I mean, look, I would assume they just immediately got Gary Soder on it. Gary Soder, their attorney, mm -hmm. is breathing yeah. fire with them saying, you know, yeah. this is, this is, you know, we got big litigation here or whatever. And Clear Channel's like, oh my God, we don't want that. You know, right. we're gonna label you a bigot in the in the press, you know, mm, that right. kind of thing. Yeah. So um uh, yeah, that's just uh but I also think it's interesting that as of this point, Friday afternoon, apparently Aftermath Foundation still still hasn't heard anything from Clear Channel. When is the when is Clear Channel gonna reach oh. out and give some options or something? I don't know. I no, they're not going to give us options at this point. I think they just want to be done with us completely. That's my feeling. I tried calling today a couple of times on the two numbers I had, and no answer. They just so I think that uh, 
I think they're just trying to hope we fade off into the background and that's the end of it. And I mean, I, I when dealing with Scientology, it's a tough one because when if they don't know that they're not being sued, they're not going to be sued or anything like that. Um, there's some fear that Scientology, Scientology has a lot of expensive lawyers and a huge uh, slush fund that they can draw from to pay those lawyers. So and and they're not afraid to use it. So, uh, you know, on that on the one hand, I, I sort of don't blame them, you know. And look at and let's look at this delicious irony that at virtually the same exact time, Karen Powell was giving a statement to the courthouse news service saying that uh, the anti-slap ruling in Leah Remini's lawsuit was a great victory for free speech. Free speech. Right, right. I saw Scientology that. Scientology telling that the newspaper ironic. that, you know, we're fighting for yeah. free speech here and we're beating Le Leah Remini. They're not, but... At the exact, almost the exact same time, they were, in fact, it wasn't the exact same time, they're putting all this pressure on Clear Channel to bring down a non-controversial statement that just says, look, if you're thinking of leaving Scientology, we'll help, give us a call. Right. And uh, well, well, the one thing we know is that Scientology lies and they're hypocrites. So, and they all lie. I, I, I guarantee if you ask any single Scientology Scientologist, uh, even just a simple question like, is Scientology great on families? Of course they are. <laughs> and, and I mean, they'll all say that. They're not going to say, well, you know, we break up families. They're not going to ever say that. So they'll lie. They're hypocrites. It's just the way, the nature of the beast. Yeah. And Karen Powell, yeah, fight for, yeah, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. We'll get that billboard down. <laughs> We don't like that. We don't like that. <laughs> what What was so um, offensive to them, to Scientology? What do you think it was about? That? I mean, to me, it just proves its effectiveness, right? I mean, it must have terrorized, terrified them that such a simple, clean message was encouraging their people to escape. Yeah, and I think that right now, they're because they've shrunk so much and their numbers have gotten so or have been dwindling so much that um they're trying to hang on to everyone that they have and if there's a message out there that somebody could just memorize that phone number an easy to memorize phone number and uh, you know they don't even have to hold a piece of paper and because sea org members their rooms get searched and they're not allowed to keep anything and but if they have a phone number that's in their head um they just have to walk out the door and find a phone and they're good to go. And that must terrify Scientology because they don't want to lose a single person. And I, from what I understand from people who've worked with David Miscavige, um, that's one of his biggest uh, things. Apparently, I, I, I think it might have been Mark Heatley saying to you, somebody mentioned that he gets up in the morning and the first thing he asks is, who blew? Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. so... Uh, he's he his his whole thing is hang on to every person don't let them escape and there it's so controlled when we were when we were down there and the billboard was up all the streets they pulled everybody in and n normally people are just walking the streets and you know you see scientologists and staff members wandering around they shut it all down for that day and it was it was deserted pretty much so the odd one i think we saw two people um walking around but the probably the and that was earlier, so it could have been they just had not been told to, you know, hunker down or whatever. It it struck fear into the world of Scientology in that area for a little bit. So had some effect, I guess. <laughs> and hopefully in that short time, some of the staff might have seen the phone number and been able to memorize it. I uh, I was driving around there after, and I had some business cards that I had printed up with the same image on it. And I saw the Scientology uh, estates guy, the lawn, the guy who takes care of the lawns. And I drove up in the car, rolled the window down, said, hey, hey, hey. He came over and I tried to hand him the card. He looks at it. No, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> They're afraid to. And their fear is more of what Scientology would do to them if they took it than what they are afraid of, of any suppressive influence. I mean, they're, they're conditioned to not take it, not look at it. But there is still that 
fear in the back of their mind. It'll so. come up in session. It'll come up in their sec check. They're going to have to admit that it they will. talked to Phil Jones and then it'll be in big trouble. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you take the card? Yeah, I took it. Did you look at it? Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, okay, buddy. That's uh, that's the uh, lower conditions for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there was also something you told me I thought was really moving. You were saying that um, where that billboard was, was so close to their headquarters and everything that where your daughter, Emily, had last told you where she was living she would be able to see that billboard from her window. Yeah, I think so. I'm not 100% sure which room that she was in. But when I was at the billboard and I looked up at the buildings, you could see that whole wing uh, where all the windows are looking down. And I, I mean, I, I may be wrong. I don't know exactly. And I, and that's like over 10 years ago that uh, that she told me that she, where she was living. So I'm not sure. But the thought was there, you know, that um, when I was standing there looking up, I thought, oh, will she be able to see this from her window or not? I don't know. Uh, wow. Anyway. And then the next day, as you were going through all this with the Clear Channel was pressuring you, you got up in the morning, you went to a coffee shop across from ASI that you knew yeah. she liked and just hung yeah. out there that morning, just in case you might. I spent, the, I spent a couple of mornings, had a little breakfast and coffee and just hung out there uh, but i didn't see any scientologists come in there so i don't know i know that that was for a long time that was her favorite coffee shop and it's just half a block from author services galaxy press where she works um yeah, a nice little coffee shop uh, and uh, i thought well I'll just go and spend i thought where am i gonna eat breakfast so i thought i'll just go down there and see if I get lucky, but I didn't see anything. And then from there, for lunch later, I went up to Gelson's, which is Katy Corner from Celebrity Center, went in there to the deli, bought a sandwich, and they have some tables sitting outside. And I just sat there hoping I'd see Sun Mike. <laughs> How long has it been now since you've seen either one of them or talked to either one of them? Well, I, I haven't seen them for over 10 years. 10 um, years. But we, we did... We did have those brief phone calls in, I think, 2016 when we were doing the billboards. So um, yeah, they didn't go well, the calls. But that one from Emily was that they were calling to get us to stop doing the billboards. And then we were doing that TV show at the time as well. And then son Mike, they knew we were there. So they had sent him off site. And there was that whole issue with it by the police tracked him down to do a welfare check. And he was apparently surrounded by handlers, you know, Scientology security. And so when he got on the phone, it's not much he's going to say, except no, don't want to don't want to have anything to do with you guys out there. So um, anyway, but uh, that was the last phone call I had from either of them. And, uh... Well, there was somebody in the comments at the website who pointed out that when Mike and Emily finally, finally break away from the Church of Scientology, and it'll happen someday, that, you know, we're going to all let them know how brave their parents were and fighting for that day of freedom for them. Well, I don't know about brave, but desperate, maybe. Ah. <laughs> uh. Oh, it's tough man. for some people to go near science. It's tough for some exes to go near Scientology buildings. Once they're out, there is there's a there is a lot of fear that goes on. And I, I understand that. Um I'm probably not the brightest or or a little more shallow. So I, I tend to not have so much of an issue with it, but I probably should be a little more cautious. But um, you know, a lot of people just um either don't like to or some are just I, i've seen people who go around and the first time they're down there uh, after a number of years um it, it is somewhat nerve-wracking um because it's sort of very almost militaristic in in its uh demeanor the whole scientology thing so they put out a fear uh thing that's that's how they portray themselves a bit and how they operate you know there's a lot of just when you're on staff and stuff, there's a lot of fear uh, involved in it. And uh, even when you're public, you know, 
fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of doing the wrong thing. Somebody's going to write a knowledge report on you and stuff like that. There's a lot of fear that goes along with it. Absolutely. Um, and uh, what did you also tell me about? Um, oh, and you had a very strange encounter. I didn't write about that because I, I don't know if it had anything to do with Scientology or not. <laughs> I, I don't know, but from what I understand that in some of these live streaming guys, the, they've had these, I guess, these sort of crazy people uh, coming out of the woodwork. And um, someone mentioned that it's not normal behavior for um, it, whether it's homeless people or, or other people to be that aggressive. Um, you know, they might want to, if they're going to go and steal something from you, they'll go steal your wallet or something. But when we were standing there by the billboard, this was after the install, we were doing a bit of filming. Um, I had my car parked across the street and down a little bit, maybe 50 yards down. And there was some guy, he was just messing with the car and throwing stuff on it, garbage and stuff. And I yelled at him, stop doing that. And you know, he, he looked a little aggressive, so I didn't go over there. I just stayed where I was. And he came tearing across the street, ranting and raving, I'm going to end you, and came right up to me, like literally a foot away, a foot and a half, right in my face, and took, he had a bottle in his hand, and he took a swing at me. And With the I, I, yeah, I don't know what, I honestly, I was too busy ducking. <laughs> to see what it was i didn't know it could have been gin could have been vodka i don't know no but if but anyway, i'm saying he swung at you with the bottle with the bottle he swung okay. at me with the bottle and uh i uh i've seen enough boxing movies to know what you do you duck when someone's going to punch you so anyway i i ducked because it was coming from the side it was a wide swing so i ducked and it kind of glanced off my shoulder and off the side of my head so there's no damage it was just the light damage and then I, I really I honestly thought about hitting him back to defend myself, but there were cameras, Scientology cameras, literally 20 feet away. And I know the only footage they'd make available was me punching him. Right. And that would be the end of it. Yeah. And I did not want to have that. So I kind of shuffled back a little bit as best as a seven year old man can do <laughs> and to get out of his way. But then he started throwing stuff. He had this metal bar thing and he threw that and missed and he threw I think he threw the bottle actually at that point and missed there. And then, and then he went back across the street and, and just hunkered down around the car and was getting time to leave. And I thought, well, Oh, we call the police right away then too. And um, I, you know, the police came, they took a while though before they arrived. I was surprised how long it took. Um, and they asked me what happened. I told them and they didn't seem that interested, but and they said, do you want to press charges? I said, no, I just want to get to the car. I said, and they said, well, we'll escort you. And then so they walked me over to the car and then they were going to talk to the guy. And I just got in the car and drove off. But uh, I would, you know, for me to press charges, I'd have to go to court, fly back down there. I signed tells you would have won that one. But, you know, just letting it go, because the guy is just as much of a victim of Scientology as anyone, if it was them to put him onto it. But. I honestly don't know, yeah. um, you know, why he picked out my car and how he knew that because I was the only I wasn't the only person on the street at the time, how he knew that, you know, to anyway, whatever it was, it was uh, ended up no damage. I mean, you know, some people were a little worried over oh, you hurt or anything. I wasn't hurt. Nothing, nothing, no damage. Just my ego. <laughs> Well, hey, there's one thing you held back from me, man, in your story on Monday. You didn't tell me that you joined the board of the Aftermath Foundation. Well, yeah, I well, I didn't because it wasn't really my news to tell. I huh? that until it was released by the Aftermath Foundation, I uh, I didn't really feel it was my place to uh, announce it uh, anywhere. So I, uh, you know, I held off on on saying anything on that. But yeah, I joined the board because. It's a it's a worthwhile endeavor, and I and and I I feel it's worth supporting. Um, you know, I know what it's like for people in Scientology and how difficult it is to leave and to have an organization that's actually there to help do that. Um, I definitely, uh, you know, I like to I like to contribute something meaningful like that. So, um, you know, when they asked me to join the board, I said, yeah, I could do it. I talked to Willie first because I knew that we would 
probably get a little heat from it from Scientology at some point, but um, she was fine on it. When you were leaving, what could an organization like that have done to help you out? Uh, what were some of the things that you wish you'd had a little hand with? You know, that's a tough one because we weren't staff at the time. So, I mean, it's not like there's nothing that they would be able to do to help stay connected with family, friends that are all disconnecting. Um, Work-wise, that was probably the most difficult for me. I didn't have really many skills. And once Scientology, like all my business and all my earnings, everything was through Scientology, Scientologists' own businesses and stuff. And um, a guy I'd worked for, I went to see him and he said, oh, you can't work for me if you're not in good standing. So I, uh, and I had made literally over the year, I was his top sales guy for every year I worked for him. And I probably made him millions at the time, but, uh, but he said, no, not good, in good standing. So I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe just to kind of get back on our feet a little bit like that, but I mean, you can't, I was public, so I should be able to take care of myself on that. It's the staff members really that coming out with nothing um, because Sea Org members, especially, they have no phone, no work history to put on a resume, no um, no money. I mean, and even if they have family, they've probably been disconnected or hadn't talked to them for maybe decades. So they're the ones really that need help. I think it would have been, it would have been nice to have, you know, a little bit softer landing when we got out of Scientology but at the same time there are enough people in Scientology get, that need more help than we did um uh I'm trying to think what uh well Mike Rinder put out a statement today saying the board has ideas for things to make things even more uncomfortable for Scientology um is there anything you can tell us about what might be coming or is that all hush hush for now? <laughs> we'll save it for later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, yeah. It, uh, yeah. It, but, but uh, we're, we're not giving up at all. I mean, I certainly am not, I'm, I'm on it today already. So, um, you know, if we don't, uh, if we don't get that billboard back, then there's, there's lots and lots of other things we, uh, we can do. Great. Great. Um, and then I'm just wondering, I don't want to, there, there probably are a few people here that are not as familiar with you as most of the bunker is. I'm just trying to think if there are some, um, uh, oh, I know what I was going to ask you. Tell me about the, your idea for the first billboard. How did that, how did the, the original idea? The call me up? billboard? Yeah, the first well, one. Well, we were, yeah, that was a whole thing back then, what we were doing. Um, we had uh, signed up, like we had been approached to be part of a, a documentary TV show. Um, the one we did a podcast about, about before, yeah. Yeah, we did a podcast about that. And, you know, just it was basically to, you know, anyone that to, it has to do with Scientology disconnection and, you know, just trying to reconnect people with those family members and friends, whatever. Um, so we were part of the TV show and, and you know, we were going to go down and see if we could contact our kids and they would film it as we tried to do that. It was kind of on the ground. We went down. So we started off doing a few things like just going to the buildings and say, hey, I'm here to see Mike Jones or you know, Emily Jones. And then and I came up with an idea of doing a missing poster for son Michael. And we posted those around Celebrity Center and um, they would take them down right away. But we handed them out. And then, uh, you know, it went a little bit viral because somebody had posted one in a uh, in their laundry room or something. And somebody took a picture of it and it got on Twitter anyway. So that went out around a little bit. And then a few people had mentioned about billboards and I didn't know much about them. So I, uh, I started researching them a little bit and, um, and uh, I can't remember somehow uh, probably through the bunker got a hold of uh, Kernan who goes by R2 on the bunker. And he uh, offered to do the artwork for it. So we 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 bantered it around a little bit, messaging. 
Uh, but really the whole design was his design. I mean, we tweaked it a little bit, but really it was his design. It was a brilliant, real, the call me to my loved one in Scientology, that was all Kernan. That was his, his concept and it was brilliant. So, um, and then I was on to, to the different companies that uh, did build boards. I got pricing, availability, looked at some sites and we weren't, we were trying to get fairly close to their buildings, but it was mainly, it was partly for that, but partly also to publicize the fact that Scientology disconnection is out there. I don't know that that point that it was as big uh, an issue um, before that. So the first billboard was going to go up. It got shut down. The second billboard was going to go. Scientology just put pressure on the billboard companies. And then we found a company called Lamar Advertising, and they knew that it was going to be Scientology, and they agreed to not get intimidated by them. And they put up the billboard for us. And uh, they did the first one. And then we did the one in Clearwater with Clear Channel. We came back to L.A. and did one near, right near the Scientology media productions. Right. Um, and um, Lamar did that one for us, too, I think. So they were Lamar, I think, was just the best out of all of them. I, I got to speak highly of them because they were they were not they, they liked the message. They were in fact, the rep said, you know, it was all the stuff that they do was, you know, advertising. It was you know, nice to do, but it was nice to be part of something that was actually, um, you know, helping people out there and a and a you know a, like a public service message kind of thing so um that's kind of and and really when we for we're putting the first billboard up and we we're trying to trying to raise money for it i think we had 70 dollars raised and then you i talked to you and and you had offered to put a link up there man within days we had enough for two months of billboard incredible couldn't have done it without you honestly it couldn't have done it I, uh, that was amazing how fast that went. All the people in the bunker just, just chipped in and they didn't know who I was really. I was just kind of, um, not really that long, uh, you know, uh, out, uh, you know, public. Uh, so, I mean, I had a few calls, you know, is this legitimate? <laughs> but, um, but it went and we, we got that. So that's kind of how I got the experience about dealing with billboards is just, uh, and you got a lot of media, me for, you got a lot of media for those first billboards. Huge. When, when we arrived for the launch of the first billboard, I was shocked. I thought it was just going to be a few of us out there. There was media, there was like, uh, the today show, good morning, America. Um, like all, all the major players were there, uh, LA TV shows, uh, uh, new shows were there, radio, um, and then I had radio interviews for months after that. Like I was like called up, did radio interviews, uh, BBC, um, uh, a couple others, and then uh, Australia. We were on uh, the morning TV show for Australia. They set up a studio for us in Vegas. And we were live on, on the morning show for Australia. That was kind of pretty cool to do something like that, uh, that they could, you know, could do that. So we had a huge amount of press. I mean, it was, it, I mean, if you look up Phil Jones Scientology, you, that's, you'll see all those TV spots on there. They show right. up. Right. So um, uh, they're, they're still out there. Well, um a little early yet, but it, it, I would think that some of those same, same news organizations would be interested in this one uh, with, you know, the controversy. News organizations love controversy. Leah put out a tweet, uh, so that's going to get a lot of attention. Um, and I'm just really curious to see what else Ray Jeffrey comes up with. Um, because you say that Clear Channel just doesn't want to have anything to do with you guys. But you guys, they signed a contract with you. And so mm -hmm. I, I'd be interested to see what some of Ray's ideas are about what to do about that. You know, we've got a kind of an in-house attorney at the Underground Bunker, Texas lawyer. And he says it's a pretty clear case of tortious business interference. Um, that, that might be the case, but that would be the case for Clear Channel. And they're not going to want to sue Scientology for one. No, I'm talking I don't about think you that, suing them. <laughs> the Clear Channel, I don't yes. think we have. I, I honestly don't. 
I don't know that that would be a good idea anyway. I don't know. That's up to lawyers to deal, deal with. But I, you know, the Aftermath Foundation is a, a, a foundation that's out there just to help those people who need it. And if we start getting into suing those who don't necessarily want to be part of that message, then I don't know if that sends the right message from us. So, uh, but I'll leave that up to them. That's, I'm just the, I'm just the, I don't know, the billboard guy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a lot more than that to the underground bunker community. Let me tell you that, Phil Jones. Uh, it's a good community you got there. Well, that's for sure. You know, I know people are interested in, in what's going on. And then there are people that get things done like you. And I, I think people have a lot of respect for that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it is tough sometimes to get people to do things, I have found. I mean, even when I was in L.A. and I go, you know, I've got these cards. Maybe somebody could go and hand them out. And there's all these people. Do you think I get one person to go and hand out <laughs> cards to staff members or you know, put them anywhere. I, it, it, like, it's tough. Most people, and when I, even when we did the first billboards to call me billboards, I had people contacting me. Say, you should do this. You should do this. Right. I'm going, right. okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, um, and on this one a little bit, maybe not quite so much, but you know, it's like, you know, do this, do that. But, um, and I mean, I can do so much. I'm only so much that that I can do on this stuff. But there's lots of other ideas out there. I've got um, um, I got a bunch of things I'm working on. So we're, you know, I'll leave it up to the the management and the lawyers to deal with with the billboard thing, how it went down, how it's gone at this point. I'm just going to move forward, and that's my view on this stuff. And that's why I was just doing the billboard with all the other noise and stuff going on. I go, you know what? Just move forward. Just keep taking the next step, the next step. And that's what I'm going to do now. And if Scientology shut down that billboard permanently, then, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter. We just keep moving forward. We're not going to give up. Just, you know, keep on keeping on. One thing um, that is unusual about your situation, because I, I talked to a lot of folks who have been separated through disconnections. They haven't talked to their kids or their parents and they hear nothing. So somebody like Jeff Levin just never hears anything mm -hmm. about his son and daughter or, you know, uh, so many other people in that list. You can see at the Underground Bunker website. But what's kind of and, and you never hear about Mike, right? You never hear about your son. Right. He, 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 the last yeah. you knew he was working somewhere at the Celebrity Center, but you haven't heard anything in a long time. But what's unusual is your daughter, Emily, is in one of the few very visible sites in yeah. Scientology as... The, you know, she and her husband, John Goodwin, run this, the PR for what's called Galaxy Press. And that is the branch of Scientology that produces, that keeps L. Ron Hubbard's fiction in print. And they have to act like it's a big deal, right? Because they're always putting these, mag these mm -hmm. paperbacks out of this wretched fiction from the 30s that nobody really wants to read. But they got to keep it in print for Hubbard. And so they go to they go to every convention. They go to the San Diego Comic Con. Mm -hmm. They go to yeah. book conventions, and I just find it's you know it's heartbreaking that you know uh, you know there's there's if you go down that disconnection list, there are all these people we've never heard anything about for ten years, and then there's Emily Jones who we see every four or five weeks, right? On social right. media or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, in some ways it's difficult to see uh, without being able to talk to her. But at the same time, um, I think she does end up having a little bit better life than most Sea Org members. So there is kind of a, she's not in doing physical labor, you know, for a hundred plus hours a week. She probably eats decent uh, food and, and dress, you know, gets to dress, you know, in decent clothes, not just have one uniform. And, and I, I remember when I was at St. Hill in the UK and the, uh, the uh, AO uh, uh, director of processing, Isla, really nice lady um, from New Zealand. And she had these sort of boots, shoes that she wore, but the sole had separated from them. And for and she, when she'd walk around, it'd be like big, wide open, gaping. I thought, when are they going to buy her a new pair of boots? And 
weeks and weeks and weeks go by. I don't think, I think I, 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 I was there for six months and I, I, I don't know if she ever got a new pair of shoes that the, they have so little money and to buy a pair of boots, a hundred bucks or 150 bucks, they don't have that kind of money. That's like three months pay or whatever, or if they, if they're lucky. So um, anyway, uh, that they, they're, um, well, Emily, the average... Emily Jones may have things a little better, but she is still being forced to stay away from you and Willie right. um, by the church. She really doesn't yeah. have freedom of movement. And this is a good time of year to remember that because uh, it's now, you know, middle of March, that annual Writers of the Future contest usually comes up. I don't know, early April or something. And yeah, so yeah. they'll be posting photos of Emily and John hanging out with these science fiction writers that are all desperately hoping to win an award for their writing and helping Scientology burnish the image of L. Ron Hubbard. It comes up every yeah. year. A few yeah. of these science fiction people will say, hey, wait a minute, should we really be hanging out with the Church of Scientology, you know? And then the rest of them are like, oh, this is a great contest. It's such a prestigious contest. And I just always try to point that out that, you know, here are all these uh, budding science fiction writers. Here are these legendary writers that are the judges. Oh, and then there's this woman over here in the same picture. She's not allowed to see her parents. She can't right. leave Scientology. She can't call yeah. people. You know, I want people to understand that there's that real complication with that contest. Yeah. yeah. When we were still in, so, no, we were in and under the radar. Um, and we were, because Emily worked at Author Services, we could go in there and and you know there were they had some events in there and stuff and i remember we were at one of their events that they had and one of the executives um i can't remember what his position was he was high up i think he was just like right under john goodwin and um and i why he would say this out loud being an executive he said something like the only purpose of the writers of the future is to put Scientology in good light, basically to safe point Scientology. And that's from the exa an executive in, I wish I would have recorded that because that's right off the, right out of the, all, the same, oh, was it the same guy? Yeah, the same guy said to me, when it, I, I asked him, how's it going one day? And he said, oh, everything's going fine, except for that guy, Tony Ortega. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they like you, Tony. <laughs> uh, I I was under the radar at the time, and I I it was tough to know how to react to that one, because <laughs> I, I was reading the bunker every day, and this and here I am at Author Services, and the guy said, "Oh, except for Tony Ortega," I'm going, "Okay, how do I react to this without?" So I said, "Oh, okay, well, uh, I don't know," or I can't I can't remember what I said exactly, but it was I just sort of. <laughs> anyway well you know you you got to make them think and that's what your billboard did it got it in their faces a yeah. little too much they couldn't handle it they went yeah. after it and sadly clear channel caved and i uh, i i do like though what you told me before that at least it's getting some publicity and it's it's pointing out that this is you know yeah. scientology cannot handle the truth right yeah i mean that's probably getting more publicity now than it would have had it stayed up but the idea of having it stay up though was to allow for uh sea org members to have a phone number that they could see and memorize but we're not done yet so we'll, okay we, we'll, well we'll check we'll in with you done. again after we'll, we find out what we'll your get that information are. to them <laughs> okay all right phil thank you so much i always enjoy talking to you and uh wow keep it up man awesome thanks tony all right talk to you later